Welcome to the first European Distance Education Network's opening event in recognition of Open Education Week. I'm Mark Nichols, Director of TAL at the Open University UK. I'm a member of the Eden Executive Committee and also your moderator for this webinar. So good evening, uh, good morning and also good afternoon. We have over 130 participants registered for this event from Europe, the UK, Bangladesh, Canada, China, Costa Rica, India, South Africa, Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Australia and even New Zealand. And if I've missed out your country, I can only apologise. I think the interest in this webinar comes from not only our speakers, uh, but also the subject we've selected, the future of the distance education university, no doubt of interest uh, to all gathered here for this particular webinar. Rather than introduce each speaker, on the right hand side uh, you'll see under the presenter notes there are some links there uh, for anyone wanting to find out more about this evening's um, uh, presenters. There's no way I could do them justice in the limited time that I have. I'd far rather get out of the way and let them actually speak to you all about the subject for tonight. How we'll be running things, uh, each presenter will speak for around about eight minutes uh, in the order listed on the uh, presenter notes. Please use the chat area to make some comments as people present and also to post some questions and I'll ask those questions toward the end of the webinar. We won't be activating participant microphones, um, it's way too complicated to do that. So if you could use the chat window instead, that would be wonderful. And the event is being recorded and will be published through Eden. So we've asked each presenter to address five questions which you'll see there on the slide and also on the right hand side under the presenter notes. So let me get out of your way and we will start off by having Sir John Daniel talk with us about the questions. So Sir John Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to you all. Um, it's slightly ironic that uh, three of the speakers in this European Distance Education Seminar uh, live within walking distance of each other's houses in Vancouver. That's uh, Ross, uh, Tony and myself. Um, my comments um, entitled Where Do Open Universities Think They're Going are based on a, a closed round table of some uh, open university executive heads that was held last October in Toronto. Um, quickly, my own background is I go back almost as long with open universities as Tony Bates. I did a three month internship there in its second year in 1972 and then sometime later was vice chancellor of the UK Open University from 1990 to 2001. So I became deeply imbued with the values of that institution and open universities generally and these four opens, openness to people, openness to places, openness to methods and openness to ideas featured in nearly all the speeches that I made. Clearly the problem today, which became very evident in our round table in Toronto, was that many of the clothes that the open universities uh, put on when they started have been stolen by other institutions. So have they become the victims of their own success. Briefly, we decided to take advantage of the uh, online learning conference in Toronto last October to hold this uh, closed round table and Maxime Jean-Louis, who did a brilliant job of organizing that world conference, uh, arranged for us to have a day before the conference in order to hold this round table of executive heads of open universities. Um, a key player in that was Alan Tate, who sadly can't be with us today, from the UKOU, who prepared a, a background paper for the event called Open Universities, the next phase. We planned this event uh, rather carefully and over quite a long period. We began more than a year in advance contacting some 60 open university heads and expected about 20 participants. In the event with visa problems, travel and so on, only nine were able to attend, which was a bit disappointing. But I think we got some useful conclusions out of it anyway. So we asked them a number of questions um, as we went round. These are the people who were there representing quite a variety of open universities, although not as many as I would have liked uh, overall. 
Um, during the course of the day, each uh, executive head got to work with each other executive head in smaller groups or in plenaries. So there was a lot of discussion. The questions we asked them were, are missions evolving? Are demographics changing? How do OUs compete to win? What are the implications of operating at scale? The opportunities for collaboration and how to combine flexibility, quality and scale. Taking these one by one, missions evolving. Uh, two of the open universities who are with us are now offering significant on-campus programs and all were aware of the implications for them of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which unlike the earlier Millennium Development Goals, explicitly refer to higher education as a goal. Another issue that came up is um, to ask whether there's a limit to how large an open university can become before the wheels fall off, and have they become a bit complacent now that they've become mega universities. In terms of demographics, it's quite a varied picture. Some, such as Italy, are seeing more older students, but by and large, the students in open universities are getting younger, and they're also focusing more on shorter programs than on degree programs. How do open universities compete? Although some OUs are entirely online, outside the West, most still use printed materials extensively. And I think one of the conclusions of the day was that you shouldn't just focus the use of technology on pedagogy, that the uh, emerging country uh, open universities are having considerable success with using it for some of their complex and large scale administrative operations. But basically, coming to grips with online learning seems to be the challenge that they are all facing. We also came to the conclusion that some of the smaller open universities have perhaps adapted, adopted too much the industrial model of mega universities and trying to operate as if they're operating at scale of hundreds of thousands when they're actually not and could perhaps get some advantages by having more uh, human involvement and less in the way of systems. We, in the group we were talking to, and I think more generally, the Open University UK is a, an, an exception in having made a very major commitment to MOOCs. So we didn't just spend a lot of time discussing MOOCs uh, during the course of, of the event. On the quest of collaboration, there's extensive course sharing among the India state OUs, and most OUs do have partnerships, and of course are finding that the challenge of managing those partnerships is greater when they're offshore. Spend time discussing the balance between flexibility, quality, and scale. And the conclusion there, I think that flexibility is the current buzzword and is obviously a good thing, but you can have too much flexibility and having some structure and some kind of regime for studies that the students can relate to is, is important. A major problem still is that most heads found that the uh, reputation of distance learning is still poor, and indeed that the terms distance and sometimes even open are not helpful. And this at a time, of course, when the conventional universities have come back um, with a very big emphasis on on the rankings so that it's quite hard to make access seem like an attractive proposition when everyone's talking about excellence and rankings. We didn't actually ask a question about OU's relation to government, but that came up anyway um, frequently during the day. And I think the conclusion was that it's extremely important not only for open universities to stay very close to their governments, but that one of their strengths is that they can use their power and reach to help governments uh, achieve their own policies and the sustainable development goals are a good example of that. So in conclusion, um, even with the small sample we had, it was clear that open universities are a very diverse reality uh, with great variations in size, mission and pedagogy. But whether the terms open and distance are helpful or not, the Open Universities are proud of their achievements in 
opening up higher education and bringing it to new places. And because of that, and because they feel that the values are mapped on to overall global goals like the Sustainable Development Goals, they feel that they have the right values and vision for the times, even if they have to work very hard to implement those in an effective way for the current uh, era. So those are my comments. So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing my colleagues. Wonderful. Thank you, Sir John. And, and we join Tony in applauding you for that, that presentation. Firstly, I need to put in my apologies. Um, there are presenter notes visible to those of us who are presenters, but not available to all participants. So I'll just link you through to the information about each of our speakers in this webinar. My apologies for that. Thank you, Sir John. Some wonderful themes there for us to pick up on. I'd now like to hand over to Ross Paul to give us some more insight as to the future of the Distance Education University. Thank you, Ross. I just want to, in starting out, I want to um, set out the context and assumptions that I'm making. I think these questions that we've been asked to look at are as relevant to uh, traditional campus-based institutions as they are to open universities. And my primary focus is on the West, on OECD uh, country universities, and some of the analysis would be somewhat different in developing countries. And I. Again, my main interest is open universities, but I'm assuming the vast majority of distance teaching institutions are, but not all. So challenges facing all universities today, uh, rapidly changing technologies, social media, artificial intelligence that are increasingly challenging the exclusive domain of universities. And of course, the impact of social media on learning behaviors of students some positive, some negative, are very much in, in the vogue. Um, all institutions have expensive infrastructures that can frustrate flexibility and responsiveness to change, um, as can faculty and staff resistance to change. In an age of enhanced accountability, there's threats to academic freedom and institutional autonomy. And the complexity of all this means uh, that recruitment to leadership positions is increasingly difficult, uh, regardless of the kind of institution. I think the challenges that are specific to open universities include uh, sometimes a sort of self-identified innovative pioneer feeling. Um, before Sir John arrived at the OU uh, in the late 80s, I did a, a bit of a study of uh, attitudes toward change at the OU. UKOU and found that there was more resistance to change there than in, in Oxbridge. Um, I don't know to what extent that's changed. Um, I think the biggest one I can think of is, is adapting the industrial model to retain its cost advantages while adapting to online learning. And that I hope there will be good discussion about that because I think that is a huge challenge for open universities. Uh, in some cases also, um, continuing to fight to uh, to uh, lower uh, to increase completion rates um, and recognizing there's huge competition from residential institutions that offer increased flexibility blended learning flipped classrooms and more student support um, also there's a loss of identity or or less identity when the UKOU started it was so clearly different that it had a whole cachet of recognition just from that. As we blur the distinction across institutions, that competitive advantage is, uh, is challenged and it's very important for each institution to be very clear about what it is. Also, recruiting non-conventional faculty and academic leaders is dedicated to the mission of an open university is a continuing problem uh, as uh, many traditional academics take positions there with their enhanced uh, reputation, and they're not necessarily dedicated to the institutional mission and mandate. Uh, and as uh, Sir John mentioned, ongoing quality and reputational concerns about open and distance learning. 
Um, conventional institutions kind of come from the opposite direction, but they have their, their same uh, challenges. Uh, training faculties for new modes of teaching and learning. Um, and especially managing the transition from a very individualistic approach where the professor was uh, supreme in the classroom to a much more integrated approach. And in a recent study of uh, online learning in Canada, spearheaded by Tony Bates, uh, we found that um, many institutional leaders were really unaware of what extent online learning was going on in their institution. But as that became more and more obvious and more and more prevalent, more and more universities were starting to build it into strategic planning and really looking for a more integrated approach, of course, with great resistance to not just to the change, but even the very notion that the institution could intervene so uh, dramatically in the teaching and learning process. Um, and another interesting thing I found uh, in looking at um, I picked a journal, the, the uh, online journal of distance learning administration, and between 2005 and 2011, there were 199 articles about distance learning. And only one of those 200 actually mentioned any of the top five researchers from the open university movement. And that was somebody from Penn State who cited all five. So I think that uh, We've missed something here with, with institutions missing each other. I think the most successful universities of the future will have a very strong and focused identity and purpose, they, they, that, and they will enjoy a concomitant academic reputation for doing something really well. They will respond effectively to students as consumers, have demonstrably successful graduates, have faculty dedicated to their mission, realize cost efficiency and effectiveness, have a supportive community, whether it's local, national, and or international, have the flexibility to build new technologies into their processes on an ongoing basis, and increasingly provide effective student support services. Well, what does this mean for the future of open universities? I think notwithstanding the significant tensions in sustaining their initial competitive advantage, they're still in, in relatively good shape. I think they have to pay more attention to brand differentiation. Um, I think that open admissions and asynchronous learning remain huge advantages in an age of lifelong learning. They have to pay a lot of attention to quality assurance following Guri Rosenblatt. And as I said earlier, modify the industrial model to gain flexibility without major cost increases. Um, the future prospects are not the same for all. I think mega universities in the developing countries um, where accessibility is a screaming overwhelming need uh, will continue to flourish. Mega universities in developed countries um, need to find ways to sustain their enrollments and economies of scale. Um, but they should do all right. Uh, high prestige research intensive universities are here to stay and increasingly smaller residential universities that really focus on teaching and learning and providing a, a supportive student social life uh, will flourish. I think the future is less optimistic for smaller distance teaching universities that can't sustain the industrial model and are, and are at a competitive disadvantage um, with more uh, flexible conventional institutions and comprehensive universities that are still trying to be too many things to too many different clientele are going to be increasingly in trouble. This leads me to think we're going to see a lot more collaboration across conventional and distance teaching universities and even amalgamations that might produce effective hybrid institutions. We know that a single institution is less regularly the whole answer for a given student uh, and that more part-time study, more credit transfer, more cross-institutional partnerships, OER, although maybe slow to be adapted, these are increasingly going to be part of the future. Um, I leave you with some questions for discussion. Are distance teaching universities in difficulty in your country? Does it really matter whether the open university as an institutional structure prevails? Can an institution both retain the industrial model and provide 
opportunity and support to individual students? And do you believe that conventional institutions are changing sufficiently to maintain their predominance? Uh, and a few references, and I one advertisement, I'd like to put a plug in for uh, Erodal. Alan Tate and I are um, co-editing uh, an early 2019 edition on the Open University and its future. Those who have an interest uh, should go on the website. The deadline for uh, outline uh, submissions is March 31st, and for uh, publication uh, data is July 31st. So I encourage you to do that. That was a free um, commercial uh, from me. That's wonderful. Thanks, Ross. And uh, again, uh, our thanks to you for that presentation. If you could perhaps uh, link to the special edition of Arodal in the chat area, I think that would be quite useful for participants to, uh, to pick up on. So there were a few uh, questions there on a previous slide. We may come back to those uh, if we have sufficient time once we've had the uh, participant questions toward the end of tonight's session. I'd like to hand over now to Antonio Tegzara, who will take us through his perspective on those questions to be discussed during the webinar. Thank you, Antonio. Well, thank you, Michael and um, Mark. Uh, sorry, just... Uh... Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, I would like also first to thank the invitation. It's uh, really a, an honor and a privilege to be sharing this webinar with uh, Sir John, uh, Ross, and Tony. Um, and first, of all, also I would like to <laughs> to say um, good good evening, good good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Um, well, actually, my approach, uh, although I come from an open university, was more uh, try to see the problem uh, from um, a perspective that the distance in, uh, education university as such, not necessarily from uh, an open university. Um, of course, I, I believe we all agree on most of the other challenges ahead. Uh, well, I've just selected a few, um, and as, I've, uh, as you can see in the, in the, um, in the, on the slide, First of all, um, I've identified what I call the proliferation of online higher education provision and providers. This does not mean only that most of the, uh, the institutions nowadays, being traditional or not, are offering online uh, education and open education. Uh, there is also a change in, the, in the, um, the type of the providers. And now we are witnessing also, uh, experiencing also, um, groups of uh, citizens, um, just network of people combining and joining and actually starting uh, an open university or uh, an operation as such. It's not an institution, but uh, it, it's, it's starting to work as such. And we're seeing in society a clear mistrust about institutions and people are just joining in and forming networks of, of learning. And this is something that will affect us also in the future. Well, one of the risks of this is, of course, the decrease on quality standards, on, on, of course, on, on the provision. But also something which I believe it's quite important, which is the loss of um, expertise and um, the central role of expertise uh, in course design and delivery. Another important uh, aspect, especially here in Europe, uh, it's the accreditation of distance higher education programs and courses, especially when they are formal. Um, uh, course uh, programs, but nowadays we uh, we are also witnessing an increased uh, combination of formal and informal uh, provision, and this is something that is now uh, on the table. Um, and especially in Europe, we need to um, adapt or to adjust the what we, the document which actually regulates the accreditation uh, programs to online provision. There's also a lack of regulation across border higher education. Um, there is also an emerging demand um, that is something that I, I also identified for can be the combination of scalability on one side, but also personalization and openness of our provision and the services that we provide. So this is something that we should, should also be addressed. Um, and uh, a major uh, challenge is also this institutional identity crisis that we are all um, uh, feeling and uh, in a way implies that these uh, business education universities reposition themselves and uh, try to enhance their differentiation uh, in relation to um, the other universities. 
Um, how can what can be the best response to these challenges? Well, one of one of these um, possibilities could be uh, or implies the redefinition of the distance notion, the notion of distance, and also of the territory of the university. For instance, at the Open University of Portugal, um, the territory is basically a cultural one. It's not um, uh, it's not the territory uh, on a geographical sense. It's the the land uh, the countries that speak. Portuguese, and so it's a more cultural-based uh, notion of territory. And we have to make uh, distance education universities innovative again. This is something that I believe it's um, it, it's uh, an important uh, response to, to the challenges that have been um, uh, put forward. One uh, other aspect relates to the establishment of alliances with traditional uh, institutions. This has already been uh, also identified by Ross. Um, once again, um, uh, the, the focus on leading research in technology enhanced and business learning and to improve the transfer of innovation from research to the pedagogical practice. This is something that I think is a little bit missing in, uh, currently uh, in our institutions. Also, a very important thing is to develop, experiment and implement pedagogical enriched online learning design models, which are actual, uh, actually enabling learners to acquire higher order skills. Not this is still a problem in a sense. And at the same time, also to uh, in, uh, introduce innovative competence-based evaluation and certification practices. We are all in needing, also needing this. Um, well, I'll skip the others in, for the sake of time, but you can find it here on the, on the slide. An important aspect deals with teacher, teacher training and tutor training. And of course, the training of students and learners to uh, act, uh, learn in uh, open learning environment. This is something that not all universities are uh, applying and is critical for the success uh, of their learning experiences. Of course, also the, uh, uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence. This is something that is coming on and we have to look at it in a very um, uh, organized and integrated way. And another uh, aspect to uh, the more institutional one or linked with institutional uh, culture we have to transform the distance education universities into continuous learning organizations themselves. Um, we, we've been asked to uh, suggest a possible vision for the future of distance uh, education universities. This is just a, a proposal. Um, these universities are, this is my proposal, these universities are special design institutions which use um, an open network organizational framework. This is something that I think it's clearly very critical for the, the new model of these universities. And they dedicate or commit themselves to advanced research and innovation in technology and has learning, as well as the traditional uh, mission of widening access and participation in higher education for all, independently of context, condition, and barriers. But because of this modular and scalable design, these universities are also more prepared than others to swiftly adjusting to changing societal changes, challenges and needs. And this is something that could differentiate them um, clearly. In uh, another uh, question that was asked was about um, uh, what is unique in these uh, institutions. Well, I, my suggestion is that is, of course, the know-how experience and the legacy uh, uh, based on research. Also, the fact that they have an integrated approach to technology and has learning design and delivery. They have fully online learning, uh, they provide a fully online learning experience. They have specially trained teaching and teaching staff and have dedicated infrastructure and technological resources. This actually sets them apart from the others. How um, might they become more flexible to, or flexible enough to adapt to new markets and opportunities? Well, just, you will see here a number of, of suggestions. Of course, starting by internationalizing and networking. But one of the most uh, important aspects is to review or in a way to change the organizational model. And I clearly think that unbundling their services is part of it. Uh, also, um, uh, recentering the university operations around research and innovation. This is also uh, something that I feel is quite critical. And um, um, in, in, in also in a more open approach, also to involve learners more, increasingly more, in course co-design processes as well. And finally, to implement an open framework te uh, technological infrastructure. 
So these are uh, basically a number of ideas that I believe try to address the questions that were asked. But of course, um, in, in, in conclusion, uh, I believe that we'll find also a, a lot of uh, ideas in common. I, I would uh, agree with most of what Ross has already uh, pointed out and also the conclusions by Sir John. So I tried to uh, just add a number of um, um, suggestions, uh, additional suggestions. Thank you. Wonderful, Antonio. Thank you. A very good presentations, a very clear themes coming through now from uh, all three of our presenters so far. And some good questions coming through too. Please do keep those coming through. Our last presenter in the webinar is Tony Bates. And uh, Tony, I will hand things over to you now. Thank you. I feel a little bit uh, nervous about doing this because it's many, many years since I worked in a distance teaching university. So I'm not all that sure that I have the right to say anything here, but that won't stop me anyway. Um, why I'm hesitant about this is every country is different and critical for ed any open university or distance teaching university is continuous and ongoing market research and particularly paying attention to demographics and how that's going to impact on the higher education system. Um, I, I'll say that because in the United States, their actual overall course in um, overall university and college enrollments are dropping because of demographics. They're actually going down. Whereas many open universities have come into existence because um, the demographics were suggesting that the universities, conventional universities, couldn't cope. So it's absolutely critical for whichever country you're in to pay attention to this. The second issue is, is the political situation and what I call social license to be an open university. I think in the UK that social license has been lost because of the government ideology. And if you're in that situation, that's very desperate because once you lose that social license, for whatever reason, it's not the fault of the open university, but it becomes then very difficult to, 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 to survive. Um, so actually, I think the point was made that you can't always be loved by government, but you must be not hated enough by any single government, otherwise you're in real trouble. Um, so it comes down in the end, whatever country you're in, to finding a niche within the existing higher education system and actually adding value that the other institutions can't do. Um, and that answer, that niche, will be different depending on the context in which you're working. So there are no general answers to, to, this, to, to many of the questions raised. So what are the big challenges? Well, it, now Canada may be an outlier here, but 83% of conventional Canadian public universities and colleges now offer distance education courses. So it's, it's no longer um, a distinct advantage to be a distance teaching institution in terms of uh, methodology anyway. And similarly with access, 75% of all people in the 20, age 21 cohort in Canada now go on to some form of uh, two-year college or university education. But within that, there are still big differences. Only 51% of Aboriginal uh, people go on to university and only 61% are first-generation students. That's students whose parents didn't go to university. So there, there's still an opening there in that market for more for, for, for opening up access. And the other, the other big challenge for um, distance teaching universities are the providers of alternative services such as MOOCs. When you have MIT and Harvard competing with you, you are in trouble actually. Whether they, have the, whether they deserve the right to do that or not is another question. It's just their sheer reputation puts you on the back foot. Um, alternative qualifications such as badges, not necessarily issued even by higher education institutions, uh, new methods such as competency-based learning, um, which the Western Governors University in the US has been very successful with, um, and blockchain. Blockchain, I think, will be important because it will give you a secure, untamperable um, qualification, a way of handling qualifications that can um, that, that employers can use to see what, is, what, what competencies a student has got. 
So what's the best response to these challenges? Well, as I said, find a local niche in higher education that serves the underserved and provide globally accredited qualifications. I, I think this is the big challenge um, because the big market, of course, for everybody is in third world countries where they don't have uh, very strong higher education systems. But what those students want is the ability to bring those credentials into developed countries and get jobs there. And without that ability to transfer credits, it's a really big challenge. And one of the things I would love to see the, the distance teaching universities and conventional universities is getting together to challenge the guilds, the professional engineers, accountants, and so on, which still refuse to accept any qualifications in, that's done at a distance. And I, I put up a graph here from Queen's University, which is a conventional university in Canada, but the oldest one offering distance education. And what they've done is um, work with the employers in Ontario um, because they're running out of engineers. It's a demographic issue. All the old engineers, are re qualified engineers are retiring, but they've got a lot of good workers who are not qualified. So they're offering a, bachelor's of art, a Bachelor of Arts in uh, mining engineering for working miners. Now, th that's the kind of partnership between uh, institutions and employers that I would like to see happening a lot more. They, they're actually going around the professional association uh, of, of engineers in Ontario that won't recognize. And this, this program is unaccredited by the professional engineers of Ontario. But to be honest, those working in the mines don't care because they got a job already. But they, they just get a better job as a result. So one of the things I think even in developed countries is to aim the underdeserved in developing countries, such as refugees, women, and the disabled, and so on. I, I really like the Kieran University model uh, in Germany that uh, helps prepare refugees for, uh, for, for work in uh, developed countries. And that means partnering with alternative funding sources, foundations, charities, and UN agencies um, and partner with local institutions and agencies in developing countries. I don't think you can do this on your own. You have to work with local partners. So what the vision for the future? Well, I think that must come from within the organization. It's got to come from the people working there. But if I was asked, I would say focus on access and adding value to the traditional higher education systems. Obviously, be best at digital learning. Uh, many distance teaching universities are not best at digital learning. They're way behind what many conventional universities are doing now. And they can't survive if they're not ahead of the game. Um, high quality, internationally recognized qualifications, that's got to be essential. And of course, a focus on lifelong learning. The market in the future in developed countries is going to be the lifelong learning market. That's going to be greater than the students coming out of high school. Uh, and that's a real advantage for distance teaching universities because conventional universities aren't very good at that lifelong learning market, particularly in the credit-based areas. They offer good continuing education programs, but they're not very good at getting their main faculty to think about lifelong learning because they're thinking of graduate. What, what the faculty are interested in is getting good research, assist, research students and good graduates that will become good research uh, professors and so on. So I think the lifelong learning market will remain uh, very important for distance teaching universities. How to become more flexible? Well, certainly distance teaching universities require a more agile, lighter, lower cost course design and development. Now, I'm not saying you don't need an industrial model to handle admissions and student uh, records and so on, but you certainly need a different model that most distance teaching universities still have for designing courses. I mean, taking two years to design a course now is ridiculous. It should be, you should be able to design a good quality course in three weeks. Um, I, I liked Antonio's point about engaging learners in course construction. I, I think that's one way to really make courses relevant with lifelong learners in particular who bring a lot of life experience um, into, into courses. And, that, and that's, not, that's often underused in the way we design our courses. Better links with the employers, as I suggested, more direct links, uh, more adjuncts and contract instructors, not for uh, the delivery of courses, but for the design and development of courses, but working with professional instructional designers. And the reason for that is that the knowledge base is changing so rapidly. 
that you want to bring people in who've got that specialist expertise for a very short period. That course may only last two or three years, and then you throw it out and bring another one in, and that means more flexibility in the central faculty. And disposable courses for immediate market needs. I've got an example down here on the right from University of British Columbia, which is the course changes every year. It's how to set up a, a high-tech company, and each year they focus on different technologies. So the content changes every year, and the content is often driven by the participants in the course who often know that content area better than the instructors do. But what the instructors provide is a framework for, for learning to enable those, that kind of teaching to take place. Um, I think, as I said, you need to be world leaders in educational uses of digital technologies, particularly apps, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence. And I would like to see um, some distance teaching universities develop their own online international startup companies in partnership with industry and government. And that will be a very good way to learn about the market and also to enable high-tech um, high developments um, within their own organizations. So in conclusion, I don't think there is an easy, no easy answer for distance teaching universities. It will vary from country to country. But there's still a great need for alternatives to the current system. There are still a lot of holes and gaps that need to be plugged and filled. Um, but if they're to survive, distance teaching universities need to change radically and quickly. And I don't see that happening. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. Uh, very provocative finish there. And I think you are right uh, that we need to change radically and quickly to survive. There are some wonderful themes that have come through across all presenters. Let me just run through some of those quickly. Um, firstly, online learning is a common theme. Obviously, there are some competitive pressures there. But the benefits of flexibility, quality, and scale have been pointed out, but also the challenges of maintaining those as uh, the future unfolds competitively. All presenters talked about alliances and collaboration, including working with partners and employers. It was pointed out that we need to take a system view. Uh, quite a few presenters mentioned the political fit of the distance university. Uh, so John challenged uh, distance and open helpful terms for us as we move forward. Uh, Ross suggested that the questions and challenges are relevant to all universities and possibly some of the solutions are as well. There are some other uh, interesting points made about research into practice uh, and the openness uh, to the undeserved potentially as a way forward. But as Tony pointed out, there is no easy answer. There have been a number of very interesting questions come through, but before turning to those, uh, let me just ask our presenters if any of them have questions for one another. Um, if so, uh, please please take the microphone and uh, ask your questions. Thank you. It's Ross. I think a, a provocative question is, um, what would happen if distance teaching universities as, as such um, didn't make it and we lost them? What, what would we lose? Well, this is John here. I, I, I think we would lose um, the focus on access to a wider clientele, which is not, as has been said, very easy for the conventional universities. It seems to me that one of the big problems at the moment, and it explains the, the election of Trump and the Brexit in the UK, is the division of society into two groups, um, a group that have university degrees and a group that don't. And the people with university degrees tend to run the show, and the people who don't tend to be struggling in those two countries, at least, and I think more widely. So I do think there's a, a, a mission for open universities to really try and get into those um, people that are sometimes called the somewheres, the people who are rooted in local realities and, and have a much more, if you like, restricted worldview than those who've been to university. And this really ties in, I think, to the sustainable development goals. I really like Tony's idea of social license. And I agree entirely that in some of the Western countries that social license has been lost. But I think globally, the SDGs give a terrific social license for trying to reach a completely new uh, group of people um, so that the developing countries don't encounter the problems that um, Britain and the US and some um, European countries are, are experiencing of an alienated, less educated group and 
conventional higher education, I think, is a large part of that problem. Well, this is Antonio. I would like to compliment, if I may, on, on this um, question. Uh, I agree that um, uh, the social agenda is something that is critical for uh, the mission itself of the this, well, the open universities in particular, since we are now uh, focusing on open universities. But it's also true that, in my in my view, that um, um, there is a difference between the European open universities, for, for instance, and the open universities, uh, for instance, in Asia. Uh, all, in Asia, uh, open universities are clear very much um, uh, linked to the social agenda. In Europe, we have lost a little bit the connection with the social agenda. So this open license that uh, Tony was talking about in Europe, it has to be reclaimed in a sense, uh, in my view. Also, uh, an important aspect when Ross asks the question, well, but do we still do we still need um, a dedicated uh, open universities if we cannot just the others? Uh, assume that role. This is the question that is being asked by governments everywhere. And uh, especially in Europe, this is uh, um, bringing quite a, an important challenge for the open universities. And most of them are finding difficulty, uh, difficult to answer. And this is something that I think we have to reflect upon and have to, um, uh, in a way, um, uh, inc improve our own um, understanding of what is our social role and mission, and also our uh, role in terms of uh, of um, uh, being uh, the uh, the front runners in the development of um, online learning, and at the same time also being the 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 carriers of the, of the uh, legacy, the research legacy uh, as well. And it is something that um, I think it's critical because if you look at the institutions which are, which are not dedicated as such to distance education, they will not invest in fundamental research. They will not invest in research which is not very much close to just um, ex uh, experimenting um, very um, small things that could uh, improve a little bit um, the practice, and uh, will not invest in a continuous way on, on research and distance, uh, on, on online learning, on digital education, as, as Tony was mentioning. And I think this is uh, critical that there are institutions who can assume that role and in that sense be piloting uh, the development of uh, higher education as well. If you look at higher education in the last years, um, who has been researching on the quality of learning? Probably us more than others. And I think this is something that should be not lost. Very important points. Let me turn to one of the questions asked by one of our participants. Uh, Sandra asks, have students of open education universities changed over time? And are students coming from the same ages, backgrounds, and needs? Uh, comments from the panel on that question, please. I made the point, uh, John, here that um, in, in this small round table we held in Toronto, we, we saw things going both ways. Um, the Open University in Italy, Matudo, is getting more um, older students, but in general, and this has been going on for a long time, the uh, age demographic of Open University seems to be decreasing. And this is partly associated also with the move to shorter cycle qualifications. Um, and I, I remember when I was at the Open University, this actually created us quite a problem because we were we made the assumption that most of our students were sort of median age somewhere in the 30s, mid to late 30s. And when that moved back into the mid to late 20s, you really got a rather different demographic and you had to adapt your pedagogy and course content to, to deal with that because these were not adults uh, with families and all the things that, that go with that. So it's another part. And, and I think Tony made the point very forcefully that you've got to, you've got to keep right up with your market research. You know, who it is you're dealing with, because the people you're dealing with yesterday may not be the people you have to deal with today. Well, this is, uh, Antonio, if I can just uh, add something. Uh, from the Portuguese experience in the last couple of years, there's also an interesting aspect to add. Uh, well, throughout Europe, and in, in our case as well, there has been a decrease in the average age 
uh, of the students, of course. But, uh, um, and we're getting, uh, we're receiving ever more younger students. But there's also an element which is uh, interesting to reflect upon. With the, fun with the economical crisis, um, it got, uh, it became much more um, important for uh, young people to secure a job. And so their first, uh, first concern is to find a job. Only then to complete their qualifications. And that has favored, uh, uh, in many situations, the fact that they find an open universities a solution for, the, uh, for their own, um, uh, for, for, for this problem that they have. So they focus on finding a job first and then com uh, um, com um, complete their uh, higher education um, qualifications through the open. Great, and that certainly mirrors uh, the Open University situation today as well. Let me flick to a more provocative question, uh, an interesting one here from J. Francisco Alvarez, who asks, are small changes to the industrial model enough? Perhaps we must think about other innovative models. And he talks about uh, whether we need to go from cabs to Uber. I wonder if uh, the panel might have some comments on that particular question. Well, Marcus, nobody is uh, <laughs> saying something at this point. I can just start off. Um, I agree with uh, with um, Paco, well, with uh, Jose Francisco, um, um, and this is something that I just uh, suggested in my presentation that we should change um, the, uh, the organizational models as such, and for, uh, it could um, include, of course, some bundling of services. Also, uh, um, to involve um, uh, the, the entire uh, community in networks, for instance, co-producing courses, co-designing courses, and all of this. So there's a lot of uh, new um, possibilities of changing uh, not just the business model, but the entire organization model, uh, opening up, uh, networking it. Uh, with Thank you, Antonio. Any other panelists want to weigh on that particular I think my microphone's muted. Okay, no, I'm open. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, the the issue here is one of how big the organization is um, in terms of industrial model. I, I, I think we do need um, to be able to manage large numbers of students efficiently. And that means uh, some, some kind of model that will handle very large numbers. But it depends what you mean by an industrial model. Um, what we're seeing, for instance, is, uh, um, uh, is, is a breaking down these large single IT systems, for instance, into smaller subunits that are more flexible and more adaptable to the needs of individual departments within the institution. So, for instance, if you're running a, a first-year arts course with thousands of students, you've probably got one system running. But if you're running graduate courses for, say, 100 or 150, you could have a more flexible system for that. So the, the big problem is the investment that institutions have already made in their existing systems. Uh, and, and also the power that the people who manage those systems have in decision making within the institution. So uh, un unless that changes, then, then it's going to be very difficult for a very large industrial organization based distance teaching university to change. Very good point. I think we've got time for one more question from the chat. Um, I'm happy to report that at least one of our uh, presenters is quite open to answering the other questions by email, those from Eba and also Sandra. But let me just pose this last one for this evening. Uh, what do you think would be the better strategy to pursue, Alton asks, to persuade faculty at conventional universities or build a new capacity to deliver open distance education programs? Perspectives from the panel, please. Do you repeat the question? Uh, yes. What do you think would be the better strategy to pursue, to persuade faculty at conventional universities to respond to these challenges, or build a new capacity to deliver open distance education programs? Thanks, Tony. I, th I think you had your hand up there too. To 
Yeah, I, actually, I think it is, it's happening already in Canada. I, it may not be the same in other countries, but uh, one of the other projects I worked on recently is called Pockets of Innovation. I went around Canada in, in interviewing faculty um, on conventional universities who were using technology for teaching. And what they're doing, they're discovering technology for themselves, and they are experimenting without any background necessarily in pedagogy or ed tech. And then they're realizing they need help, and they're going to their local centers. So you have to have somebody there that faculty can turn to. Now, the model often has been to try to push that into the faculty, and I don't think that, that works. So faculty have to be ready to move in these directions. But you need to have the support in place when they are ready to move. And I think it, it's both bottom up and top down. I think the central administration has to have a strategy and a policy for distance education and online learning within the institution. Um, so faculty are aware that this is a direction in which the university wants to move. But it also has to come from the bottom up, where faculty are using technology in nearly all the cases I saw to solve a teaching problem. They got a problem, and they saw how the technology could help re resolve that teaching problem. And then that opens the door to bringing in things like learning objectives, course design, and so on. But it has to start with the faculty member. You can't force it down them. I, I would really agree with that. Um, and I am optimistic, because I'm seeing some significant change, uh, because uh, there, there is an excitement around some of the some of the opportunities and some of the developments. And in institutions where there's more of a dialogue and where there's some leadership from the top, there is a more concerted effort to integrate. It's going to take some considerable time because, as I said earlier, it's not just about change; it's that whole notion that the institution can intervene and try and bring everybody together. So it's kind of ironic that the open universities achieved that from the outset and are now having to undo uh, a lot of the industrial model because it's too cumbersome and inflexible. So they're coming from one direction and the universities, the conventional universities are coming from the other direction where they're having to integrate uh, what faculty are doing in ways they've never done before, and that's really going to take time, but it is happening. And that I think a lot of our discussion obviously has addressed developed countries. In the developing countries, I think that the problem is very different because there, that's where the millions, hundreds or tens of millions of new students will be coming from in the next two decades. And there I really do think you need big systems to deal with not so much degree level study, but the kind of um, employment related stuff that I was talking about earlier. So I think it's a horses for courses and different models in different parts of the world. Well, if I may just um, add something as well, uh, I would uh, reply that, uh, mm, well, apart from the comment that uh, Sir John made, and I agree as well, there are different realities across the world, even uh, focusing in, in Europe or well, uh, also in the US and Canada, I think that there is a, a place for both. Uh, so for uh, technology enhanced learning on one side, and also for the development of uh, dedicated distance education and open and distance education um, structures. These are not fundamentally the same uh, and will um, will develop different things and will have different capabilities. And uh, I think this is uh, important to keep both. Wonderful. Thanks to the panel for their responses to that question. Well, it's now coming up to the hour. Um, let me thank our presenters, our prestigious presenters, for their, their time this evening and presenting with the, in the morning for most of them uh, for what they've shared with us. I wonder if all, everyone in the participant list could either change their status to applaud or us just uh, and note their thanks in the chat window to our presenters for this particular webinar. Thank you. Great. Some good uh, comments coming through there.
Let me remind you that there are some other events happening in Open Education Week through Eden. Uh, do check the website uh, for the next events coming up. Uh, and thank you again to our presenters and to everyone who's joined us for this evening's webinar. Much appreciated, and I hope you found it both very useful, also very entertaining. Um, I've certainly found it very insightful. And again, thank you to the presenters and to all participants for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for organizing it. Yep, good show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna.